today on Against the Grain, what if we are all living an illusion? I ask this in all seriousness. What if the way we pass our days running around madly, grasping at things, pursuing this or that, does nothing to fulfill our human potential? I'm C.S. Sung. We'll talk with Peter Kingsley about his thought-provoking book entitled simply Reality. are listening to Against the Grain on KPFA 94.1 FM and kpfa.org. My name is C.S. Song. It reminded me just a bit of The Matrix. You know, the film series where people live in a certain reality, but what's really happening to them is dramatically different, something shielded from the consciousness of all but a tiny minority of people who learn the secret and try and do something about it. What Peter Kingsley suggests in a provocative, carefully researched book entitled Reality is that we, you and I, and pretty much everyone, live under a kind of spell. We are spinning around in a daze, deaf and blind to what's really going on, to what can liberate us and truly fulfill us and make us effective participants in life. Sure, we've got our plans for accumulating this and attaining that and changing him or her, but that's all part of our self-deception, our misunderstanding of what's essential. As Peter Kingsley writes, So often we try to convince ourselves we are living a full, contented life, but there is always something pulling at our heart. Ambition and restlessness are just its shadows, and it will go on tearing at our hearts until we start to acknowledge what is missing. Peter is an internationally recognized thinker and lecturer in the areas of Western philosophy and spirituality. His most recent book is Reality, and we're happy to be joined by him in studio. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So this book focuses on two early Greek thinkers, uh, Parmenides, uh, often called the founder of logic, and Empedocles, a, a foundational thinker in the areas of, of science and cosmology. Why focus on two people who lived such a long time ago, 2,500 years ago? Well, the past is important. History is important to a degree. And... You know, if you look back at history, there are so many, so many thousands and millions of data that you can look at and study and really study the whole of your life. But when I started out as a teenager, having a feeling that I had to get back behind modern philosophy, behind the history of recent philosophy, behind the recent history of ideas and religious ideas, even political ideas, I had a gut feeling I had to get back to the Greeks. And then it was a strange experience one day after another, it was like finding a nerve. There are all these different parts of your body that are really important in different ways, but we know when we hit a nerve, it matters, it hurts. There's a great deal of sensation there. And I discovered that Parmenides and Empedocles, these two Greeks, who I knew nothing about, were very, very, they they were on the main line. They were right at this nerve that lies at the very, very beginnings of Western culture as we know it. And it was the people after them, in the century or two after Parmenides and Empedocles in particular, who realized how important they were. But then gradually, the renown, the fame, the reputation of Parmenides and Empedocles was eclipsed by the reputation of the people who came after, and really, in a way, to my mind, weren't doing something quite as important or fundamental at all. So, let's take Parmenides, uh, the the founder of of logic, as you uh, say in this book, uh, kind of considered a a father of rationality, of rational, uh, discursive thinking. Uh, In in broad strokes, and and then we can perhaps get more specific, what did you find about that legend of him and whether it was accurate? Well, there are many, many problems. And I guess I've always been, ever since I was very young, been looking for something authentic, been feeling that there has to be something authentic, even offered to us, and we can maybe talk about this later, about even 
in our own Western civilization, which is dismissed so much as materialistic, rationalistic, especially in today's kind of postmodern deconstructionist era, as passe and finished, I knew there must be something hidden at the beginning of this culture because it didn't make sense to me the way things have been going. And with Parmenides, it was really a matter of stage by stage, looking, looking. Now, okay, we, here we have a guy, supposedly, according to all the histories of philosophy, the history textbooks, he is a rationalist, not only a rationalist, the founder, the father of Western rationalism, the originator of logic. Well, to begin with, he wrote a poem. And that's a bit weird, because how many logicians nowadays would write a poem? It doesn't really add up. And then when I started looking at this poem itself and getting enough knowledge of ancient Greek to be able to really work my way around it, I realized, first of all, that he isn't the bad poet that he's sometimes, in fact, really all the time made out to be nowadays. And there were incredibly skillful uses that Parmenides made of poetry, which had effects that eventually I was able to track down and say, yes, these effects tie him in with religious traditions, spiritual traditions, mystical traditions, incantatory, magical traditions. But they'd been put aside and totally ignored because people just want to look at him as a philosopher. If you look at a philosopher, for philosopher you're not going to see anything else. That was the beginning. Then the other very, very important thing which wouldn't leave me alone was the very beginning of this poem describing the origins of so-called logic. Parmenides describes how he was given all the knowledge that he presents in the rest of his poem as the result of a journey into another world. And what was that world? Specifically, he describes it in all the language and the terminology of his times as a journey into the world of the dead, which is where, first of all, it's where we go when we die, but also for the Greeks, this world of the dead, Hades and even beyond Hades, this is where originally the physical world came out of. So he's been taken to a point which nobody basically, except for a couple of heroes, Hercules, Orpheus, Odysseus, is allowed to get to while alive. So that already puts Parmenides in a very, very special place. He is an initiate. But this world gives him the secret of what is beyond life as we know it. And of course, immediately, that opens up the whole area of what is the purpose of life and how does it exist, what does it mean in relation to death, which we tend to ignore and push aside as much as we can. And when you talk about things like uh, purpose of life and meaning of death, th this seems so far away from the conventional understanding of, of what logic is, what, what it constitutes. Not at all, and this is one of the strange, strange paradoxes for us in the West, because we tend, we can go back century after century and look at the history of philosophy to see why. It's a really strange story, but for us, logic has come to mean a justification, basically, of the rationalistic worldview that we live in. This already goes back to Aristotle. Logic is used to confirm certain perceptions, essentially. It's based on certain rational rules which have been invented to justify and substantiate the way that we see things anyway. But now, if you look at, say, Buddhist logic in the East, which I came to long after discovering the same principles in Parmenides' logic, you see that their logic plays a very, very different role. It's actually a tool which is designed to undermine our ordinary perceptions and our ordinary values. First of all, it's designed to not only make us question, but to make us see that this physical world doesn't quite add up. And this is something that Parmenides and also his successor, Zeno, talked about very, very beautifully. They would basically say, look, let's take this world on its own terms, but when you take it really seriously and look at it truthfully and honestly and carefully, it doesn't make sense. In what way, in what way would he characterize the human condition, the, the way that we tend to live our lives? Well, this is a very good question because it's something that Parmenides and Empedocles go to quite a lot of trouble right at the beginning of their respective poems, both of them, to describe the human condition specifically. And just here I have a few lines from Parmenides 
where he describes humans, all humans, as, I quote, knowing nothing. The helplessness in their chests is what steers their wandering minds, as they're carried along in a daze, deaf and blind at the same time, indistinguishable, undistinguishing crowds. Now, it's not a very flattering way to describe people, and uh, it's funny to see also how century after century of scholarship has really tried to deflect this criticism away from being a criticism of humans in general, because that would even include academics or scholars, God forbid, uh, and put it somewhere else. But this is Parmenides' way and also Empedocles' way of saying, look, life as it is lived is aimless. And however much you think you're achieving, it's insubstantial, it's just like leaves in the wind, it's going to blow away, and before you know it, it's gone. And so are you. And this knowing nothing reminds me quite a bit of Socrates and, and the dialogues he had with people. And, of course, you write about it in your book, Reality, this idea that he, he would keep asking questions and eventually the, the person who was holding a certain opinion, who was trying to justify a certain opinion, would, would realize that that opinion might not have any justification and Socrates would maybe leave them and, and they might be confused and a, a little bit uh, dismayed. Is this all part of it? Is Socrates part of this lineage of you think you know, but you don't know? Very, very much. And what I actually did in this book, Reality, for the first time in modern scholarship, is to demonstrate the very, very specific links between Parmenides, Parmenides' his successor, Zeno, this Parmenides tradition and Socrates, because usually Socrates is considered the beginning of Socratic Platonic philosophy in a way that the so-called pre-Socratic philosophy was quite separate and different from. And one of the important points in this book is actually to show that there is a continuity. But of course, what is this continuity? And that is something that I try to make as real for the reader as I can. Because we have, somehow through so many hundreds and thousands of years, we really have forgotten we've lost the sense of what Parmenides and Socrates and these people were actually doing. <laughs> it, it, we get into very, very difficult water here because we in the West, especially with, with democracy, we all assume that we have the right to our own opinions. And of course, on one level, that is absolutely 100, 150% justified and necessary. That's how our democratic society works. But what's actually been forgotten is that Socrates, for example, or Parmenides, wasn't just coming in with more opinions. He was coming from a depth of awareness inside himself, which he had earned, which he had discovered. And I have to emphasize there were very, very specific ways and practices in Greece in that time for coming to that state of consciousness and becoming stabilized in it. And the point about that state of consciousness is it's not actually a state of believing, it's a state of knowing. And that's very, very difficult because if you come into a democratic setup, whether it's ancient Athens or modern San Francisco, the question is going to be, well, why do you say you know something that I don't? Why do you have something to contribute that's any better than my opinions? And this is a very, very delicate area. Very, very delicate, very wonderful to look at, because Socrates really wasn't putting out new opinions, new beliefs. He was aiming at, and he succeeded, in undermining people's beliefs about themselves, their superficial beliefs. And of course, he got into a great deal of trouble, so much that he was put to death. Let's talk about uh, about thinking and, and rational thought. Um, there's something that both Parmenides and Empedocles uh, were trying to convey about its deficiencies, what, what it doesn't accomplish for us, how it's perhaps counterproductive to getting to, to, to real meaning. You point out how thoughts lead to division and separation. And I'm going to throw another uh, vivid image of the book at you. Uh, you write that our minds are like a dog's bladder. C could you uh, elaborate? This is, again, it's, it's a huge, huge area because... We live here in a world of thinking. 
not just of opinions, but all the time of ourselves, where we think and think about everything, and everything is done on the basis of thinking. And what Parmenides said was, you can't understand thinking unless you get beyond thinking. I mean, this is actually impossible. You can't understand thinking by thinking about it. And I think that a lot of modern philosophers get caught in this trap of thinking about thinking about thinking, and it just doesn't work. And this is why when Parmenides describes being carried at the beginning of his poem, being carried into another world, which is the origins of this world as we know it, which lies behind this whole visible universe, he's also talking about getting behind the structures of perception that actually maintain this world and keep it intact. And so, this is the path of initiation, that you have to get behind thinking, you have to get past this world that we exist in, in order to understand it. It doesn't mean leaving anything behind. It doesn't mean that you leave thoughts behind after that. You have to come back and do the best you can in this world of thinking and in this physical world. But actually to be able to experience another state of consciousness, which I have to say in my experience is quite objective. It's not a matter of, well, different mystics or different people in different traditions say that. There is something that exists. And I know many people would like to disagree with that, but it's, it's just something very, very simple. And once you experience that simplicity, then you can come back and do the best you can in this world of complexity and continual thought and division. And if I can just say one thing which for me is very, very beautiful about the teaching of Parmenides and Empedocles in particular, and I really have to emphasize that Parmenides, as well as making this journey into another world and coming back with a very, very strange formulation, the earliest formulation of what logic actually is, he also was presenting extraordinary scientific discoveries in his poem, which hadn't been talked about or mentioned or even known about by other people when he was writing. So, the point I want to make is that for Parmenides and Pericles, nothing is excluded. Thinking always tends to exclude things. And when we think, we have an opinion, and that automatically excludes someone else's opinion. And this is why it's very difficult trying to convey what someone like Parmenides was talking about, because there is always room for the opposite. The opposite is always included, and this is why it's so beautiful how in the first half of his poem, Parmenides will say, this logically is the way things are. This is the reality. But then in the second half of his poem, he will actually go on and say, well, that's the truth. Now I'm going to deceive you. And I'm going to talk about this world of illusion. He doesn't leave it out. Of Peter Kingsley's book, Reality, Houston Smith, who is author of The World's Religions and Forgotten Truth, he calls the book stunningly original. Reality is momentous in its implications. The book is aimed at one of the highest ends I can imagine to restore to us the understanding that the original purpose of Greek philosophy was to launch the Western mind on a profoundly spiritual course. Thomas More, author of Care of the Soul and Dark Nights of the Soul, says of Peter Kingsley's book, There are few writers today you must read. Peter Kingsley is one of them. With absolute clarity, he writes about the most challenging issues and at the same time is inspiring in the most ancient sense, filling us with spirit and hope. His words will change the way you imagine your life. The time's moving quickly. There is quite a bit of discussion, particularly in the section on Empedocles in this book, about the consciousness, the awareness that you were talking about, what they are asking us or inviting us to do in the way of, of sensing things, of being aware of perceptions. What are they, what are they inviting us to do on, on a concrete level in terms of where we focus and how we focus our consciousness? Well, to begin with, there's the quality of silence, of inner silence, and they both made, as it were, a condition for coming to these practices. 
the need in an individual to be aware that something is missing already in their lives. And if we just come to this in the same spirit that we think we can accumulate some other experience, it's not going to work. There has to be some sense of of a lack in one's life. There has to be a some, somehow a sense just of a little place somewhere inside us of something that's missing, something that doesn't quite add up, something that's not right, maybe a sadness. And Empedocles states it very beautifully where he describes how there's actually a place we need to come aside to inside ourselves. It can be inside or outside. Which is different? Which is a place apart? Which is somehow outside of this perpetual round of acquisitive existence. Because if we just come to this with the same acquisitive mentality, we can get all the different black belts in uh, martial arts and in meditation techniques, but it's not going to be going into the right place inside us as human beings. So this element of silence was very, very important. Somehow for there to be a pause, so that we can actually hear there's something missing. It's like, if you are silent, you can actually hear the silent voice of something inside us asking for something else. And we usually smother that call. What is so beautiful about the practices themselves, and I, I really feel I need to emphasize that this is something quite unknown. I need to preface this for a moment, the practices. We in the West are now in a situation, thanks to the opening up of the world in so many ways. I have to say, not in new ways, because the world has always been open. There has always been a tremendous amount of travel. 2,000, 3,000 years ago, people were already traveling from Tibet and Central Asia down to Greece and the other way around. I have to emphasize that. There have always been these connections. Certainly the Western world, the Mediterranean, was not closed off from the rest of the world, as people try to say before Alexander the Great and so on. This is all not true. There were always the paths, and people did travel remarkably fast as well. But what has happened now in the West is that somehow there's this very, very deep mindset which has become very, very concrete. It's there underneath our everyday thoughts, our everyday ideas, our politics, so much. And that is this notion of Western civilization as something materialistic, as something rational. And so what has happened for the last 200 years in particular is that when people get a spiritual craving, when they feel something is missing in their ordinary everyday life, they look, well, first of all, they look to Hinduism, Buddhism, and then to more esoteric traditions, theosophy, and recently to the wonderful Native American traditions, South American traditions. And really, if you like, the nerve of my own work, the core of it, is to be saying, ah, but there is a sacred tradition at the roots of our own Western world. And that it's really fundamental for us now at a collective level to get back to that sacred core of the Western world, behind all the misunderstandings, behind all the rationalizing, the materializing, to get back to the sacred core, because otherwise there really isn't much of a future for this Western civilization. We have to somehow get back to the beginning. And so, the reason why I'm prefacing what I'm going to say in this way is, here we have at the roots of Western civilization, in so-called philosophy, the very birth of Western science, not just a series, but a whole system of meditation techniques. If you like, you could call them yogic techniques, because they include breathing practices and so on. And this is really quite extraordinary, that the founder of Western logic, the father of many, many aspects of science even, and with Empedocles of cosmology and so on, was giving meditation techniques, yogic practices, as a prerequisite for understanding the teachings that would come later. And I just also put in here, because this is something I touch on in reality and also in In the Dark Places of Wisdom, the book before that, there is now remarkable archaeological evidence which cannot be denied, but has been very, very strangely silenced for the last 50 years, demonstrating Parmenides, this father of logic, was in fact a priest of Apollo, 
and he was involved in very, very specific ecstatic practices to do with dreams, dream interpretation, so-called incubation, rituals, and these are the real foundation, these are the background for Western logic, not what we like to believe. But these practices, to get onto the techniques themselves, what do they offer if you want to come to them? Again, they offer everything because nothing is excluded. On the one hand, they offer techniques for going into this other state of consciousness, this other world that Parmenides described, this world of tremendous stillness, of physical stillness, if you like, of meditation, of certainly of mental stillness, but they didn't just ignore the world of the senses, as I said earlier on. They also gave the most remarkable techniques, especially in Pedicles, for really becoming aware through our senses and for realizing for the first time, and it's quite a shock when you start to do this, that normally we are not aware. We go through the day, we drive our cars, we make breakfast, we talk with people, go out to dinner, watch television. But when you start to do these practices, you actually start to realize that that is not being aware. We don't know how to see or listen. And this is something we, we believe we do, but it's like we are sensed. We don't sense. We don't really sense, perceive. It happens to us. But there's a whole level of waking up which brings the world together and gives it a much, much deeper meaning through these practices. You made certain allusions to inside and outside, to uh, nothing is excluded. And we have a, a pitifully small amount of time to really go into the nature of reality, to try and, and grasp even a small portion of, of what that means, the, of what we are missing in our daily human lives that Parmenides and Empedocles and other people are trying to tell us. So if I were to ask you very simply, what is reality and how does it relate to my internal state, my sense of being independent and separate from other things, how could you begin to answer that? How do they begin to answer that question? Well, we're not separate. This is the problem. We start from the apparent sense of separateness, which really we Westerners have. Native American people don't have that. We are not separate. And this eventually brings with it the rather beautiful realization, you know, one can start off by doing practices, by, if you like, meditating. And I have to say that these meditation techniques are very specific. Remember, they're being given by the founder of logic. These are not airy-fairy, otherworldly techniques. These are very, very specific. You can begin by saying, I am meditating, but then after a while you start to realize you are being meditated because everything is one and everything is connected. So it's very difficult for me in a way to start off, as it were, from this assumption that we are separate, because it doesn't really work. It's a part of the illusion that we were talking about earlier. You know, this is a, this is a difficult thing because it, it's hard to get beyond the sense that we are autonomous, that there's an external world and we somehow interact with it. Uh, and in fact, when you are describing reality, what came to mind for me was the Tao. In Taoism, there's yes. this kind of uh, motionless, featureless expanse that, that we're all a part of and we participate in and, and it's, it's not separate. Is, are there similarities between the Tao and, and what they're trying to tell us about? Very, very much. And one of the principles that I find so beautifully similar in Parmenides and in Taoism, in Chuang Tzu, in Lao Tzu, is that the more we try to get something for ourselves, the less we end up with. It's this very, very strange paradox that by trying to accumulate things for ourselves, we diminish ourselves. And by somehow becoming nothing, and of course there are many misconceptions that can come up around that idea or that reality of becoming nothing, then 
everything is given because you do become a part of everything, which is what we are in our essential natures anyway. So, yes, and there is the flow. This is something that I, again, find so beautiful. That there is this constant sense, both in Taoism and in Parmenides' and in Empedocles' teaching, of something natural, of something organic. We tend to think of spiritual practices often as somehow unnatural, as needing sacrifices, asceticism, abstention, giving up this and that. But again, they say there's nothing to give up. It's a matter of including, but it's a matter also of including our deeper needs, our deeper longings, our deeper urges, and not leaving those out, which can so easily happen. We only have a, a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'm going to read something in the book, Reality. There is nothing left to grasp or learn. All we need has already been given and lies quietly within us, and there will be no separation, no loss, unless you are careless enough to let it go. So the nub of the idea is that that everything we think we want or think we need or are attaching to is already internal? Is already internal and we really don't have to struggle for it or fight for it because there's something so clear and definite inside ourselves that we don't need to struggle for it outwardly. And just to give one very, very brief final example maybe, which I find so interesting, these people, Parmenides in particular, and many others from around his time and before and after in the Mediterranean two and a half thousand years ago, they were lawgivers. And it's very, very strange that for them, laws were actually given from this other world. And this is something really inconceivable to us now, because we think that if someone was to come along and say that they, they were given some laws in a dream, you say, yeah, what leg are you trying to pull and what are you trying to get away with? But these laws that were brought from this other state of consciousness, they were selfless. They weren't concerned with what my party can get, with what I can acquire. And it's wonderful because, again, it's like at the democratic level, the thinking process, which is absolutely beautiful and fine, you can work out laws. But there is this other level where laws can come through, which I have to emphasize were laws for a whole society, laws for cities, and also laws for the individual, the laws that we have to live by. Peter Kingsley, he is the author of a number of books, including In the Dark Places of Wisdom and Ancient Philosophy, Mystery and Magic. His latest book is Reality, and we thank you very much for joining us in studio. Thank you. Thanks to you. Again, it's Peter Kingsley with an E, K-I-N-G-S-L-E-Y. Dot O-R-G. Reality is a sumptuous, uh, big book. It's very accessibly written with large type. It's, it's kind of a funny thing. It's a quick read, and yet it's a very thoughtful read. You'll stop and you'll think, and you can tell, hopefully, from what you heard from Peter Kingsley today, uh, that he puts a lot of thought and research into what he writes. Again, uh, let me just read a couple of things that people have said about this book, Reality, Houston Smith said, Stunningly original, reality is momentous in its implications. This book is aimed at one of the highest ends I can imagine to restore to us the understanding that the original purpose of Greek philosophy was to launch the Western mind on a profoundly spiritual course. Michael Bajant, author of Ancient Traces, writes, This book contains the purest and most powerful writing I have ever read. Larry Dossi, MD, author of Healing Beyond the Body, Reinventing Medicine and Healing Words, writes, Peter Kingsley is a successor to Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. His lectures and writings, especially his latest book, Reality, reveal hidden dimensions of consciousness and how it manifests in the world. His message conveys hope and meaning and reveals majestic qualities of the mind we have forgotten and which have been ignored by Western authorities, quote authorities, for centuries. Peter Kingsley is a transformative and life-changing force in our world. Never have we needed such a message as now. And finally, from the Bryn Mawr Classical Review, 
Both well-reasoned and revolutionary, reality is a work of rare genius. It is both a brilliant scholarly argument and a fascinating read, a story that takes us far outside the boundaries of scholarly conventions. Kingsley has brought to life a tradition that lies at the roots of Western culture and has dared to reveal its foundation stone. Perhaps it is time for us in the West to learn to speak again. Kingsley has already started. Uh, a lot of people stand behind what Peter Kingsley is trying to say. This is not some, as he said, airy fairy uh, fad. This is about urging us to wake up. This is suggesting, daring to suggest, that we're somehow living in a daze, that we're confused, that we're uh, deaf and blind to what's really going around. We are running around, acquiring things, consuming information, getting pulled in by all the stimuli and phenomena that surround us. See, there's a, this torrent of appearances, he calls in his book. But, but wait a second, maybe he's suggesting, and he's suggesting these thinkers are suggesting, maybe we need time just to breathe. Maybe we need to wake up from what is in fact a dream world that we're all immersed in without knowing it. And maybe we need to access something deeper, something infinitely more satisfying, something infinitely more fulfilling than the kinds of projects that we pursue every single day but then we maybe achieve that project, we buy the car, we get our favorite vacation, and then we're consumed with more longing for something else. We want a better experience. We want ultimate reality. We want to get beyond our concerns. Our ambitions, supposedly, are to help us. He's suggesting, these thinkers are suggesting, our ambitions are our obstacles are obstacles to the kind of stillness, to the kind of contemplation, to the kind of awareness that allows us to access something much richer. This book is not, by the way, for the complacent, the, the satisfied, the people who are smug with their reality. This book is about challenging the very foundations of your beliefs, your worldview, what you understand the priorities of your life to be. This book is about challenging where you stand, the foundations of your your beliefs. I want to read you a few more comments about the book. Jacob Needleman, San Francisco State University philosophy professor, says this, With its startling blend of spiritual passion and the bold vision of a consummate scholar, this remarkable book invites us, even to the point of demanding us, to open our eyes to the unseen realities nourishing the ancient roots of our civilization. Of even more importance, it invites us to the great work of opening ourselves to the mystical reality that is calling from within each and every one of us. Sayed Hossein Nasser, author of Knowledge and the Sacred, writes, This is not only a seminal study of the origins of Western thought, it is also a guide to the rediscovery of truths which lie hidden in the souls and minds of men and women today and which urgently need to be brought to light in a world groping in so much spiritual and intellectual darkness. It seeks nothing less than to reveal the original nature of Western philosophy in its true but long-forgotten sense, and through doing so, it forces contemporary human beings to re-examine what it means to be human. There is so much spiritual hunger out there. There is so much, I, I'm, uh, this is my commentary, there is so much a spiritual longing. Uh, and as he said, we, we often go t to Buddhism, to Hinduism, to traditions outside of the Western canon. He's saying within the Western tradition, within the Western, what we call intellectual tradition, there are wonderful seeds of thought planted by people who embedded these seeds, often in poems that scholars have misconstrued, have misunderstood, because they don't want to grasp the spiritual, the mystical origins of Western civilization. All our facts, all our reasoning are just a facade. This book is about, and I'm reading now, about what they have covered over, about the reality that lies behind. It's about the buried treasure that is our birthright, our heritage, and about what we have to be prepared for if we want to reclaim it. And one more quote from the book, the human mind is a wonderful instrument designed to help us operate in a world of total deception, but that also means its power to deceive has no bounds, and one thing it will never do is leave alone what lies outside its domain. Instead, it, the mind, will automatically distort any reality it touches, convert it 
into something else. This is a seminal study. This is momentous in its implications. This is not a, a fly-by-night book. This is a book to read, to cherish, to think about, to understand, and it's very accessible. He wrote this not for uh, the scholars in the ivory tower, but for people like you and me.